In Northern California, standing on a bluff uh, overlooking the ocean, I caught my first glimpse of where the Klamath River meets the Pacific Ocean, also representing the point where young Chinook salmon migrate out of the river, venture out into the ocean before returning years later to spawn, thus ending their life but beginning the lives of the next generation of salmon. The placard in front of me also reminds me of the Yurok tribe's connection to this river and to the salmon dating back thousands of years. Little did I know these would be the first of many connections that I would experience. At the mouth of the river, the Yurok tribe has a fish processing facility and an office housing a, few, a team of fish biologists and fish technicians. Hunter Matz, lead fish technician with the Yurok tribe, describes the significance of salmon to the Yurok culture and their place-based identity along the Klamath River. As like the salmon population keeps going down and like if we ever get to a point where we completely lose it, it's like that's a huge point, part of like our culture that gets taken away. And I honestly think like, like being able to be a fisherman here and even just being able to stay inside of this community, it really is hinging on the salmon itself. Because, like, if you think about it, like, if there's no salmon here, like, other than being able to keep up with our other traditions, like dancing and stuff like that, there really isn't a whole lot of a reason to be in Klamath. For the communities that rely on salmon as part of their culture and for food subsistence, Issues impacting the health of salmon have become all too common. Even just looking at the past 25 years, Chinook salmon have faced a variety of challenges, many with anthropogenic origins stemming from the existence of dams along the river system. Some of those challenges include drought, fish kills from warm temperatures and low flows, wildfires, water diversion for agricultural use, and there's an emerging trend that could be impacting future generations of Chinook salmon as well, uh, and the communities that rely on them for their food subsistence. Thiamine deficiency complex, or TDC, is a condition triggered by low levels of thiamine in the salmon's body. Spawning females with low levels of thiamine will lay eggs with correspondingly low levels of thiamine as well. Fish that hatch from these eggs will display lethargy, loss of equilibrium, and irregular swimming patterns leading to increased mortality, thus putting increased pressure on the future salmon populations and again, impacting those communities that rely on them for their food subsistence. The main hypothesis for the onset of TDC is the overabundance of anchovies in the diet of Chinook salmon. Anchovies contain an enzyme called thiaminase that actively degrades thiamine in the fish's body. Historically, Chinook salmon had a diverse diet consisting of sardines, anchovies, krill, squid, and other small forage fish. Today, that diet is much more reliant on anchovies due to shifts in prey availability and diversity in the ocean. In California, TDC was first observed in Central Valley River systems, and studies of Central Valley Chinook salmon revealed some concerning results. Based on those concerning results, we wish to duplicate those studies for the Klamath River Basin. In a partnership between the Yurok Tribe and NOAA, connecting traditional ecological knowledge with Western science, we sought to assess TDC in the basin. Using data collected in years 2020 and 2021 from three distinct locations in the Klamath River Basin, as outlined in the red circles on the map, we examined the data to answer three main questions. What is the frequency of thiamine deficiency or thiamine concentrations below critical thresholds? What is the relationship between thiamine concentration and egg size or egg diameter? And does uh, the m length of migration that the fish are migrating through the river system also have an impact or any relationship to the total thiamine concentration? Chinook salmon typically stop feeding once they enter the river system to begin their spawning migration. So therefore, at that point, no new intake of thiamine is entered into their bodies, so they kind of have a finite amount of thiamine at that point, and it can only be depleted moving forward as they migrate throughout the river system. So fish that are sampled at the mouth of the river, we would expect them to have the highest levels of thiamine concentration because they haven't endured that migration yet, and it's the shortest amount of time that's elapsed since their last feeding 
compared to other sample groups have, who have migrated further up the river. Previous studies of uh, Central Valley Chinook salmon determined that salmon eggs need a minimum concentration of five nanomoles per gram uh, in order to have a, a greater than 95% 95 95 chance of survival. Survival de rates decreased rapidly as you drop further below that five nanomole per gram concentration mark. Looking at the graph, total egg thiamine concentrations are on the vertical axis and egg diameter measurements are on the horizontal axis. Looking at the total thiamine concentrations only for now, all of the fish sampled from the lower Klamath at the mouth of the river contain thiamine concentrations above that 95% survival rate threshold as denoted by the red horizontal line on the graph that you see here. Further inland, past the confluence of the Klamath River and the Trinity Rivers, the Trinity River winds through dense forests. Some of the largest trees in the world are in the forests of northwestern California. Some are as old as 2,300 years old. Uh, my advisor, Keith Parker uh, from the Yurok Tribe and Lauren Bommelin from the Tolawa Tribe, Explain to me in great detail how these, how these forests have been fed by marine-derived nutrients carried by the salmon. The salmon migrate up the rivers, they spawn and die, and then the animals feed on their bodies, depositing the nutrients into the forests, feeding the forests with all the nutrients they need to thrive, as you see here. So quite literally, these forests are made of salmon. Uh, Keith and Lauren's communities recognize this connection to nature um, and also respected that natural connection through their culture and their spirituality built around the idea that they are part of nature and not above it. For fish that continued migrating up the Trinity River, uh, eventually reaching the Trinity River, at River Hatchery, our second um, sample location, 247 kilometers from the mouth of the river, Still, no 2021 Chinook salmon had been observed with total egg thiamine concentrations below the 95% survival threshold. For salmon that bypass the Trinity River and stay on the main stem of the Klamath River, they will ultimately travel 305 kilometers, enduring the longest migration of our three sample groups before arriving at the Iron Gate Hatchery. Despite the longest journey and amount of time spent removed from the ocean system, no fish from this sample group fell below the 95% threshold either. Looking at the basin as a whole for fish sampled in 2021, a clearer story comes into view. A relationship between distance traveled and total egg thiamine concentration can be observed. Fish with the shortest migration, symbolized by the square symbols on this graph, displayed the highest thiamine concentrations as a group. Fish with the second longest migration, the triangles, were the next highest as a group, and the fish with the longest migration, the plus signs, had the lowest concentrations as a group. Additionally, the same trend is observed in relation to egg diameter or egg size. With measurements increasing in magnitude as you move across the horizontal axis, fish sampled at the mouth of the river had the smallest eggs and thus the, total, uh, the largest total thymine concentrations compared to fish sampled uh, at the other hatchery sites with the longest migrations those eggs had more time to grow and develop, but the thiamine stores had depleted with less total thiamine concentrations to contribute into those larger volume egg sizes. So the studies that I mentioned previously from the Central Valley uh, Chinook, of Central Valley Chinook salmon um, had two hatchery sites where 50% of their sample populations had over uh, or below five nanomoles per gram below that 95% survival rate. So compared to the Central Valley River system, the, Chinook, uh, the uh, Klamath River Basin had very favorable results. However, continue uh, studies should be done to observe these trends over time to see if there's anything that's happening moving in one direction or another. Um, and I would encourage future studies to also incorporate and leverage traditional ecological knowledge along with Western science. Lauren Bommelin, a dance maker for the Tolawa tribe and one of the last native speakers of their language, describes how science has the ability to adapt towards appreciation and ecosystem stewardship rather than management and economically driven approaches. And we need to listen, we need to observe, and you know, we need to look at all the factors that we can and not just the economic ones and not just the I'm hungry one. We're all hungry. Everybody has to eat every, every day, everybody has to eat. 
but how do we have a balance? How do we, how do we look at? So, I just think if science could help us out now, and shift its own paradigm of way of thinking, and observing and appreciating, you know, that basic appreciation. The Yurok have a deep appreciation for the river and all that it provides. Seen here next to the mouth of the river is a Yurok ceremonial site where dances were practiced, thanks were given to the creator, and prayers said for these natural gifts to be returned the following year. On that same bluff and same placard high above the mouth of the river, it is described how the Yurok tribe would use weirs to gather salmon. Holes were placed in the weirs, allowing a sufficient number of salmon to escape and continue their journey. After the tribe had collected only what they needed to survive until the following year, the weirs would be removed, allowing the salmon to migrate freely. Modern fishing practices um, include the use uh, of gill nets, so a little different than the weirs that were historically used. Um, but the fishermen rely on the same traditional knowledge that they've used for generations, placing their uh, nets in the locations and at the times of the year where they know a fish are going to be caught based on those family stories being passed down uh, year over year. The fishermen are also able to identify the different runs of salmon based on their appearance alone. Uh, they have a knowledge of the river system that's been cultivated by a place-based identity for over thousands of years. The only thing they don't have anymore is a reliable source of food that can sustain them throughout the year. My advisor, Keith Parker, told me that uh, the indigenous communities of the area had been able to thrive along with the salmon for thousands of years. Western culture managed to screw it up in just about 100. I want to leave you with one final quote from Keith Parker, uh, describing the dire situation that the salmon currently face and offering hope for their future. This is a dichotomy year. You know, on the one hand, I want to be sad because it's the second worst predicted run um, since the late 90s, right, where um, they've closed pretty much the whole fishery on the West Coast, not just the Klamath. The ocean salmon fishery is closed. The in-river sport fishing in the Klamath is closed this year. Tribal fall fishery will likely be closed. Um, all indications are our council will probably vote to close our fishery as well. Um, but then on the other hand, the really awesome, amazing news, let's jump up and down and do back, is that the first dam is being removed in July. I'm extremely optimistic that if human beings just get the damn dams out of the way <laughs> and we get out of the way and let this fish, these fish do what they've done for, you know, millions and millions of years, um, that this river will come back real quick. So I want to give a, a big thanks to my capstone community. I was humbled to, to be able to work in a partnership with uh, Scripps, the Yurok tribe, and uh, NOAA as well, combining traditional ecological knowledge with Western science. So thank you to Keith uh, from the Yurok tribe, Isabel from Scripps, uh, and Nate and Tommy from NOAA. Also to uh, Lauren and Hunter for their contributions. And also want to thank my uh, parents who have traveled to be here today. You've never missed an event. Thank you. I've got a question. Okay. Uh, th thanks for sharing that, that project, Nate. Uh, so what is, you, you mentioned the dam removal. Um, what is the significance then of your findings um, considering that the basin will undergo the largest dam removal in world history over the next year or two? So I think the, the importance of that is the way that the, the project's being marketed and the attention that it's getting as the world's uh, largest dam removal project in history. So not only for TDC, it's just a very critical time for science being done um, on the Klamath River, knowing that it's going to be under the scope of scientists um, you know, in America and around the world as well. Uh, meaning that we need to have a baseline of data pre-dam removal, and then we need to duplicate those studies after the dams have been removed as well. And if the river system rebounds um, to a level of health that we hope and expect it to, uh, that data and that science is only going to inform uh, and encourage future similar dam removal projects and rewilding of rivers. Thanks, that was awesome and awesome news about the dam. Dam. 
Um, <laughs> um, I was wondering about the issue of um, lack of diversity in the salmon's diet. Um, have you thought about, obviously, you're not God, <laughs> but have you thought about what could be done in that regard? Uh, so it, it's an interesting question, and you know, it's it, it's one of those things where, particularly the forage fish, you think of sardines, you think of anchovies. They go through these natural cycles, depending on different ocean warming periods, um, things like that. So part of that is natural, but what we need to understand better is is it being driven by climate change? So if we're seeing these results where the anchovies are much more prevalent in the diet in the Central Valley, uh, further south from the Klamath River. Is it a result where if temperatures in the ocean warm further north, is that what we're going to see as well? So a lot of the work that's been done uh, in the Central Valley is of gut content analysis to determine you know, the level of anchovies uh, in, the, in the salmon system. So I would encourage you know, similar gut content analysis in the Klamath River Basin uh, to determine, I think that's gonna be really the first indicator to see if we should expect um, you know, thymine deficient results based on the amount of anchovies we're seeing in the systems of those fish.